Welcome to the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. Exploring alternative investment opportunities available to the everyday investor. Here's your host, Ben Lakoff. Hello and welcome to the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. Today's interview is with Ryan Wyatt of Polygon Studios. So Ryan is the head ex-head of gaming at YouTube and made the jump full-time into Web3 with Polygon Studios earlier this year. Web3 or blockchain gaming, this is going to be huge and the future is certainly bright. I really enjoyed this conversation. We covered a ton talking about where blockchain gaming is today, where it could be going, some pitfalls for game designers, the new mechanics that blockchain allows, and actually some valid arguments that these non-NFT gaming people have as well as some things to watch out for for investors in this area. This is a great one. Give it a watch, send me your feedback, and please follow me on Twitter so you can join these live conversations next time. We actually had a really good Q&A section that I've cut out for this. It was really, really fun and rewarding. All right, let's do this. Ryan Wyatt, Blockchain or Web3 Gaming. Enjoy. Ryan, welcome to the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. Excited to have you on today. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. We're doing these via Twitter spaces, so would encourage my listeners in the future to jump on and you can ask questions at the end, but we'll do the podcast portion and then we'll open it up at the end. Before we kick things off, let's start off with a brief intro into you, background, and your role right now with Polygon Studios. Yeah, so... I'm kind of a lifelong gamer. I've worked in the gaming industry uh, my whole life and career. I got really into, I started playing video games when I was three years old, very young. Got into esports. Gosh, this would have been in, you know, about two, the early 2000s, playing Counter Strike competitively. Got into Call of Duty because of competitive, competitively. Commentated esports for a while while in college and early days. Worked for a company called Major League Gaming, which was one of the, the large tournament organizers in North America. So all my all my passion and love for gaming really was rooted in esports and live streaming. Spent some time at a company called Machinima, which was like, you know, try to aspire to be, a, you know, like the MTV of, of gaming on YouTube. And then I ran and started the gaming vertical at YouTube, which is one of the largest businesses on YouTube is, as you can imagine, gaming creators, gaming streaming, gaming video. And so did that for, for close to almost eight years. And uh was an angel investor in Web3, started last year, really like investing in really cool blockchain games and other blockchain-based apps. And basically was like, I'm, I was becoming so enamored with the space that kind of advising and investing was enough of my time, right? Because I just was wanting to spend almost all my time in it. And so, you know, after leaving YouTube, I came to Polygon. And I just loved everything about Polygon. I'm a big believer in Ethereum. I think in order to scale Ethereum, you need a company just like Polygon. I thought that the team did such an incredible job, like having this diverse tech stack. And then on top of it, you know, they really did a good job getting from zero to one really, really well as founders and entrepreneurs. And I thought I could bring a lot of value of helping do the one to 100 thing. And so what Polygon Studios is, is effectively it helps developers, creators, however you want to look at the ecosystem, integrate Polygon's tech stack and then making sure that we support them through their lifetime on Polygon. So even after they integrate we're here to be advocates and supporters of the developers. So that could range from helping with, you know, smart contract auditing to go to market, to tokenomics, to game design, to investment and everything in between. But we really want to be at service to the developer ecosystem. And and honestly, that's what studios is all encompassing. And so I'm leading the organization and building out a team that's going to be focused solely on making sure that when developers build on Polygon, we bring value, much like companies when they're raising funds, they're looking for people who are going to strategically help them outside of just capital. We look at Polygon in the same way as developers are going to need a variety of things to help continue to support them long term. We want to make sure that we demonstrate we care much beyond just them initially integrating on the platform. And so that's the the long winded answer to uh, No, I think that that really helps kind of set the context for this conversation. So one, you're definitely getting your parents back when they said like playing video games was not a good use of your time, right? Turning for it into sure. I, yeah, for types, sure. Types of careers, you know, you parents listening, it's not that bad when your your kids are playing these games. Sometimes there's a lot of lessons they learn, but we at Charge Particles were massive fans of Polygon. I'm big fans from the, the get-go. Excited to see you with Polygon Studios. 
But coming from the head of gaming at YouTube, I mean, let's start off and just back up and define Web3 or blockchain gaming, what it is and why it could be so important and, and, and allure somebody like you to come over from a, a position at YouTube. Yeah, I mean, I had like one of the, you know, personally, it was one of the coolest jobs in the world. And I loved it so much. You know, I really enjoyed my time there. And I learned a great deal. And I thought, you know, we we did a lot of great things as a team and organization. And, you know, everybody that works on the YouTube gaming team, I, I hired and I think very highly of and I'm excited to see what they continue to build. You know, for me, it was it was kind of like, it was a variety of things that got me excited about it. One, I just think in the spirit of when you, you know, we're spending more time in, di you know, digital worlds, digital environments, you know, we're tethered into devices, those experiences are getting much richer and, and more complex. And I felt like people are going to continue, and it's already been demonstrated in the gaming industry, people spend a lot of money on, on digital goods, right? And I think what was going to, you know, my, my expectation is that people will have a higher expectation than just a license for an item or whatever it may be, right? That as they spend money in this digital world, they're going to want that value to be recognized and realized. And so I really became fascinated with the concept of just like blockchain app development from this alone, right? And I, I, and I really then started to go down the rabbit hole of seeing very talented developers leaving the major gaming studios to fundraise. There's We've never seen this much capital in the history of gaming being deployed in the gaming industry, both Web 2 and Web 3. Obviously, a disproportionate amount of this is going to, you know, on-chain games. And so it's just this like really unique inflection point in tech where I felt like this is going to be a great opportunity for me to jump in, right? I'm not a crypto native, you know, person. I wouldn't identify that. I don't have a story about how I, you know, got into Bitcoin in, you know, 2015 and stuff, right? I immediately became fascinated because I was like, oh, this is great. Like, now you're starting to marry all of these awesome concepts that gaming has already done a really great job of developing, you know, having a point, a system, having digital cosmetics and digital goods that you can participate in the game in different ways. And so for me, it was just this nat natural evolution and I wanted to be a part of it. I, I also wanted a new challenge, you know, when I came into to YouTube to, you know, start the gaming business and gaming vertical, it was a great new challenge, right? You know, Creator economy was on the rise, you know, figuring out how to, you know, work with creators to monetize, to incentivize and help them develop better content, you know, thinking about how to scale that organization. So now I come over here and it kind of takes a lot of those same skill sets and background and interests, right? There's an investment arm. I'm, you know, I, I like investing. I'm a venture partner at BigCraft. Like, I think that took some of that in there. I like scaling organizations and building that, you know, Polygon is going to be here for a while. And, you know, we need to make sure that we scale according to the you know, Web 3's astronomic rise. And so, and, and a big part of what Web 3 truly is, is embracing community, right? Th you know, this whole movement is owned and operated by the community. And so I love that because I think, you know, I really enjoyed, you know, helping creators find ways to, to, to build their businesses on YouTube. And now it's helping developers build their businesses on Polygon. And so the similarities were actually really striking. And for me, it just felt like a next evolution of being a participant in this space. I never looked at it as like gaming is necessarily solving these, your blockchain gaming is solving these like very unique challenges. I look at it as there's this whole new product feature, knowing that all the data is on chain, right? At the end of the day, it's like you have all this information on chain. What can you do with it? What does it allow you to create? And so me, it's like new product features rather than a solution. It's like a whole new world of being able to develop and be creative in ways that you otherwise couldn't do before. So that's what got me excited and just felt like I wanted to be part of this and, and spend my time in it, both because I feel like I can have an impact in the industry, but I have never learned so much in just the three months, two months I've been at Polygon. I mean, every call I find fascinating and I'm learning something new. So, you know, I'm really enjoying it. Oh, yeah. Drinking from the fire hose. Well, firstly, Forever. welcome to Web3. Gotta love 24-7, 365 markets. But the community is fun indeed. That 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 is 100% accurate. Yes. Uh, you mentioned, I mean, talking about the brain drain a bit from Web2 and partially, potentially the massive funding in Web3. Let's talk about stage of the market. I mean, I've heard you talk in, in the past about a difference in timeline. You know, eventually blockchain will have a fit, have a, a place in a lot of these games, but games take a long period of time. You mentioned from your viewpoint as an investor in this market, how should investors think about timelines and kind of current state of the market where we are now? 
Yeah, I mean, so I think the thing that, you know, some of the stuff that we've seen out, right, you know, a lot of people are pretty critical of kind of the the games available now. And that's a lot of, you know, proper game development cycles are very time consuming. And I don't think there's enough of a genuine appreciation across the entirety of this industry. Uh, and by this, I mean, Web3 on this concept of how difficult it is to make a game, right? Like just making a game is very hard in its own right. When you start to add things like free thriving marketplaces and economies on top of it, it becomes even more difficult. And so everybody's an investor now. So that's the thing that's good and bad, right? Like with these free open platforms and economies, it's great because everybody can be participants, everybody can be builders, but you have to know that like the internet, that comes with its own set of problems that bad actors will take advantage of those things. So we see obviously the NFT projects where people are getting rugged and we see, and obviously it's good that, you know, regular, you know, regulatory bodies are starting to crack down on that. But I say all of this is people really need to have an appreciation for how difficult it is to make a game and how difficult it is to balance an economy on top of that. Whether you're talking about play to earn or whether you're talking about just like a blockchain based marketplace within a game that's purely cosmetic, you have to understand some of these things because now that everybody can be an investor simply off of a product roadmap and an inting of an NFT, it, it, you, you need to be mindful of that. And so I really try to look at one, the kind of teams that just show the humility that comes along with making a game and the difficulty that it takes and that that there isn't a clear blueprint. I mean, even Axie, with its success in the play to earn category, has has gone through a number of its own problems that they're having to tackle and solve for and continue to iterate and build on. And so a lot of it is I'm interested in teams that kind of showcase how difficult it is and articulate how difficult it is and how they plan on addressing it. I get very nervous about people talking about kind of games and things that they're going to deliver in 12 to 18 months, because most likely if they stick to that timeline, it'll be a lackluster product. And so that's that that's one that we will go through a little bit of a, a regression in the industry that'll be natural and good for the industry is going to be, you know, 95% of these projects are not going to work out. And that's very normal in the games industry. But the great thing about Web3 and blockchain-based games is you don't need hundreds of thousands of users in order to be deemed successful for a game, right? If an indie game in Web2 launches and it only gets tens of thousands of users, it's definitely a flop. They lost money on the project. It didn't work out. You can actually launch a game and have a thriving community in the tens of thousands in Web3. And I think that's the beautiful part about it, that you can actually build these experiences that are much smaller at scale or more tailored to certain communities that may be more niche and still find an abundance amount of success. So there's a kind of, it's like a double-edged sword here. There's like really great opportunity that is going to open in this space, but it's going to come with a lot of responsibility and it's going to come with bad actors. And it's going to come with like how we suss all of this out as a collective industry as we continue to spend more time in it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, Kevin Kelly's thousand true fans comes to mind instantly when thinking about this. You know, it doesn't have to be this blockbuster that millions of people use. You can find your niche. You touched a bit on hyper financialization of game aspects. Everyone's an investor and some of the difficulties and hurdles that comes with this. But this leads into there's been a you know, relatively significant amount of backlash from certain gamers about NFTs. I'm curious, what valid arguments from your perspective do you think they have? Yeah, I mean, I think they have a number of valid arguments. I actually am pretty empathetic to it. I think one, when I was kind of looking at it, there's a couple of things. I feel like with the backlash, it, it came from, first of all, you had a lot of crypto native folks talking about how crypto and blockchain was going to revolutionize gaming, which I think is just off-putting in its own right, because gamers hate in you know inauthentic, you know, unauthentic behavior, right? And so I think it just didn't re really resonate with um, a lot of the audience that like, oh, you know, everything's going to turn into an NFT, right? You know, imagine in Minecraft, blah blah blah, right? And I think it was very off-putting, and because people would see NFTs that are you know you know like a board ape selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars and it's like am i going to get priced out of games and then you would point to axie infinity as like oh here's a game that you know is is, is in web3 and it was like oh there's a 800 hundred dollar barrier to entry because you need to own these axes to get in right so it opened up a number of uh, of issues there that i think cause for frustration also a number of these you know chains actually have a pretty decent carbon footprint and so that's why it matters deeply to polygon that we want to be well positioned that we are carbon neutral today and we want to be carbon negative actually in the future 
Ethereum switching its consensus mechanism will help that whole end-to-end solution. So it's not just Polygon and what it's doing as an L2 or sidechain, but also what Ethereum is doing main debt. And so I think the carbon footprint issue was actually fair from some folks. I also think people see a lot of the projects where, you know, they see friends getting hurt, right? Like somebody goes in and spends money that they that they they think is going to have a return or they're really excited about investing in something and a project goes to zero because, you know, malicious intent. So I think there's a lot of really fair, valid criticisms of NFT gaming. And I think that's all right, right? Like th- there's 3 billion gamers in, in the world. You know, people are going to want a variety of different things and, and want different things. I also think implementation was rather poor for mainstream gaming. You know, like Ubisoft's adoption didn't really resonate well. Did, you know, it was a very lackluster execution, I think, in the eyes of the gaming industry. So along with it, I... I I think none of this really matters, though, you know, Ben, like at the end of the day, because these are things that will continue to get better, right? Like what you're seeing right now is the earliest products that are being developed on chain. But people will iterate, people will learn, things will get better, fidelity of games will get better, experiences will go beyond just play to earn games. So then that will start to resonate more and more with core gamers. And so the backlash, I'm kind of sitting in the middle where I'm like, I get where the backlash is going, but I also have visibility of what the future looks like. And it's so exciting. And so I do, I am very optimistic that a lot of gamers will come around to it because they will realize games, you know, games that are built on Polygon are, are carbon negative. So that's not an issue. You know, there's no really little to no transaction fees and that's not an issue. And oh, hey, by the way, this is a really fun game that I enjoy playing. And so it'll be less divisive and it'll be less fixated on some of these underlying topics within NFTs. Yeah, I think those are those are very valid. And congrats, Polygon going carbon negative in 2022. I mean, just huge. So uh, that that was a common criticism about the carbon uh, uh, <laughs> carbon issues. Definitely excited to see that. I'm curious. There's a lot to unpack. And Ryan, I could talk to you for freaking hours about that. That's for sure. There's like 30 new questions pop up as you're talking. I love it. But Touching briefly on gaming within other ecosystems, obviously you are a Polygon Ethereum bull, but are you interested looking, what is kind of your stance on these other alt L1s or L2s and the gaming ecosystems that are developing there? Yeah, I mean, look, I don't think it's a winner take all market. So, I mean, I think that wouldn't really embrace the ethos of web three or community for me though you know i kind of look at it this way it's like i'm a i just am a big believer in ethereum right and i think ethereum is here to stay and so if you believe in that then you kind of like then you build you should build on polygon like right like mainnet ethereum especially in games right like you know mainnet ethereum with it with with costs associated with it don't make sense for games at scale right and so I kind of look at it that. And sometimes I just wonder, you know, if there is already a great solution in place for a games company, right? Like, okay, I like Polygon, the tech stack's great. I can I can build my own sovereign chain and there's, you know, super nets there. I have, you know, our public chain and our, our POS. We have our ZKs that are coming. All of a sudden you're like, I have, kind of have all the tech solutions I need to really build my business on Ethereum through Polygon. And oh, by the way, everybody, you know, has a great rich history in the gaming industry that's on that BD and developer relationship team. So why should I be thinking about anywhere else? I think of it more like that than I spend about any other time thinking about what other L1s or L2s are doing or what their value prop is. Because at the end of the day, it's like if, if, if you ask somebody, what is the criteria of your chain selection? And you start filtering out people that are just trying to take money, you know, get a quick dollar. And you start to ask them really questions of what they're looking for in a chain. I can assure you that like Polygon, it handles all of these ones, you know, the, these asks for, you know, clients and we want to keep, keep doing that. So yeah, I, it'll be interesting to see how everybody scales accordingly, you know, especially how some of the L1s genuinely achieve scale. You know, none of us have been, you know, a lot of the L1s and L2s, you know, make claims of what transactions per second that we can scale to and and what we can do long term. But Time will, you know, time will tell and, and, and we will all be tested. And, you know, I think there will be an ex- expectation that we can scale accordingly and, and have, you know, a reliable uptime. And so the chains that can do that long term and provide security as well will be the ones that are standing. And so I think it's good for the industry to have a lot of different ones because you're learning and iterating. You know, we're learning from each other at the same time as well to even our competitors. So I think that's actually good for the space. Uh, everyone benefits from that. Yeah. And all of these. Uh, blockchains work really well until 50 million people come on and push transact at the same time, right? Yep. They're becoming more and more battle tested. I heard in the 
the Bankless interview, which was fantastic in February, that you mentioned games are going to be the largest onboarding funnel for NFTs and crypto. Yeah. Why do you believe that? Oh, man. It's like to, to me, too. And I hope it doesn't come off as arrogance, but it seems like a no brainer to me. And the reason I think this is so many fundamental mechanics in a lot of these games are already aligned philosophically with like how crypto and, and blockchain works like it's almost kind of comical like you th- I, one of my favorite games i play is valorant right i've always been in a tactical shooters you know counter-strike and play valorant you know as a, as a dad and like ceo i don't get to play as much if you think about that whole experience it's like you're buying riot points those riot points buy a digital cosmetic item right and, and then counter-strike you're buying a digital uh, item and you have a marketplace. And although it's a closed marketplace, it still has, you know, the ability to sell. And so for me, I'm like, wow, all of this makes a ton of sense. Like you come into a game experience, you're buying a token for that game. Now, all of a sudden that token actually has governance. It has a value. You're actually invested in the company in some way, shape or form. Now, all of a sudden you're coming in and using those tokens to buy digital assets, right? Now you own those digital assets. Those kind of ebb and flow of value as well. You actually can liquidate them if you ever are done playing that game and want to go to another place. And and so like a lot of these core mechanics of what's happening in the space are actually going to be really well understood and easily translatable to the gaming audience. And so if you think about it, we go back to that stat, let's say, you know, 3 billion gamers out there, you know, even 500 million to a billion ultimately understand this flow pretty well. I mean, honestly, even if you're playing Candy Crush or Clash Royale, you understand this flow. And so I think it will come very intuitively to folks with blockchain-based games and that they will actually become intrigued by it once they get games that are more up their alley and, and, and more accessible and more broadly appealing. And so it just makes sense that that's where it's going to happen because it's not going to ha- it's, it's demonstrated it's not going to happen through DeFi alone. There's not enough people. And, and, and so I think this is, this is the the funnel in which it will happen. You're just because it's ultimately, it's honestly just the total addressable market, how intuitively they will understand these core mechanics and how quickly they'll just set up wallets and participate in this space without even really realizing that they're doing it instinctively. Yeah, that makes sense. Very much in the same way that uh, like NFTs or art collectibles have been a Trojan horse to bring in all of these other artists. And now it's bleeding out to other digital media types definitely believe that this will happen with gaming. But I I always hear this like uh, drumbeat of my NFT being used in this game carried across to the other game and, and things like that, that, you know, sound great in theory, but it's kind of hand wavy. And I'm not sure if that will be the exact way that it shakes out. There are many different ideas on what blockchain or web three gaming could look like. What common narratives do you hear that you disagree with? Yeah. I mean, the interoperability of digital assets is kind of nonsense. Like it's not going to happen, but there's, <laughs> it, there, it's just not like the, between shaders and game engines, it's just like, it's just full stop, not going to happen. Now there might be worlds where there are asset, you know, a parameters for people to develop in and integrate. And so like, maybe that is, but I actually think a lot of, when I think of like digital interoperability, like kind of how people talk like, Oh, you own this, you know, AK-47 in this game and like you can go bring it into this game. Like that's not going to happen. But what I would love to see is how non-gaming brands really enter the space at scale through NFTs. And I'll kind of break this down and what I mean. Like let's take a, let's take a random brand. Let's just, uh, okay, let's take, a, you know, Prada, right? So Prada has a line of NFTs, right? And one of them is a Prada backpack, you know? And I would love for the utility to start to be in that Prada backpack that you own is probably a bunch of stuff that Prada, you know, would be doing. And this is obviously, I'm just making this up. It's all hypothetical. But like, you know, I, you know, they have a utility of like, you get to be at a runway show. They have a utility where maybe you get a discount off of something or you get access to something and yada, yada, right? I would love to see Polygon take somebody like that and help them partner with like eight different prominent games to be like, I want you to make the Prada backpack in your game, the Prada backpack in your game and in your game, because it's a unique digital asset I want you to create in each one. And then I want whoever has the underlying NFT ownership of that item to be able to access that digital item in each one of those games. Now that is interoperability in my mind, but that takes BD, that takes product partnerships and like that's relationship establishing, licensing establishing and so forth. So I think that'll be a really cool way for brands to enter the space and add utility to their underlying NFTs that they own, right? So that they can really start to bring value to it. I don't know that your, you know, your question was like ideas that I don't like is the interoperability one because I don't think it's realistic. But this is kind of my proposed solution to digital asset interoperability. 
And it'll have to come through the vehicle of partnerships, which is why I put a lot of value into hiring like a world-class team, because I think it's stuff like that that you're going to be able to bring to the table. So say game company X is figuring out what chain they want to partner with. It'd be really cool to be able to bring them in and have like a suite of those kind of product partnerships for them to plug into. And that, that that's at the, the benefit of, you know, the NFT owner that has the underlying digital asset, as well as the overall brand and product that's launching it. And you could do this with like a number of, of products and brands. You could do this does your product uses just like a cool fashion example, but you know, you could do this with a, a, a Burger King and have fun with it, right? There's a lot of different things that you could do here. So I'm looking forward to how we navigate interoperability. And- it's definitely not e- extremely clear how, how that will work out, but I, I think that approach makes a lot of sense. When I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a crypto permable and end up hanging around crypto permables in my little echo chamber as a relatively, like it sounds like you've been uh, monitoring the space, but you know, full on drinking from the fire hose 24 seven now, where, where do we just look crazy or where could things go all wrong and, and this whole thing not end up as, as wonderful and as amazing as we think it will? I, I would say like kind of my first, let's say 90 days full time in this space, an observation that I would have. Of, of crypto native folks is that um, one, it's there's no like measured take. You know, it's it's a lot of it, and I'm speaking in like broad strokes here. This is not everybody, but I noticed that there's a lot of there's no like even healed measured approach to the space. It's kind of like Web three is going to eat Web two, fiat's going to die, right? It's all of these like it's very hyperbolic in the way that it's going, and I think I just have a much more personally and methodical perspective on how the space plays out. You know, and I I think it will serve a large subsection of the tech industry, but I don't see it swallowing all of these things whole. And so as much as I am bullish, I made a you know massive career jump into the space. So obviously I, I am, I think my, I think I'm a little bit, maybe more even killed or more measured than kind of some of the folks that have been in here. And that's great, right? Like maybe that's good. I think like it got to this place because a lot of people have a lot of passion and they're willing to be strong advocates and, and have these beliefs. But that is something that I have observed that is a little different. Yeah, that makes sense. And the difference in understanding of timeline, I think, is always a big one, right? a, a, a big one, right? I think a lot of people talk past each other because they haven't set the context of the conversation in the time frame. And I also think people need to be much more patient. It was funny. I was looking at something. It was like the Internet in, you know, was invented in, like, what, 85 or something like that. And then, you know, AOL comes out in, uh, like, 93. And when AOL, anyway, when it went to IPO, it had, like, 200,000 paying subscribers to it. And so I think people also on the other flip side of that extremism that we're trying to talk about are also like weirdly skeptical of Web3 because it hasn't like doesn't have the Amazon of Web3 yet. You know, like it hasn't launched something. It's like, my goodness, you know, the space is so, so nascent and so young still, all things considered. It hasn't been around long. So I also think people need to be more patient in starting to see the big successes that are going to come out of it and they will come. And so that's an, that's the, maybe the other side of that coin of the hyperbole. Yeah, and they will come. They just take time and they are moving quickly, but it's never as quickly as we would want it right. to see it. So, yep. I mean, things are moving incredibly quickly, but, you know, it's never quickly enough, but it's still way more quickly than before. The space is well designed in the way that development is democratized and that the, and how much the community owns. I actually think it, it's going to accelerate on a much faster timeline than the internet, you know, and, and how, how long it took the internet to get adoption and getting PCs at home. Like we talk about like the wallet issue, having a lot of friction. Well, like people getting on the internet had a ton of friction because they didn't have computers in their homes. And like, that wasn't, you know, that was something that was starting to gain traction. And so these same kind of frictions have existed in technology, and I think all of it will be reduced over time. And I think because it's so democratized, people will solve frictions much easier. And they're not, and because of the global nature of crypto, that's the beauty of it, right? You know, it's it, everybody's on an equal playing field. Things will move faster. Oh yeah, borderless, connected, twenty four seven, and then thinking about fundings, funding and incentives. Like it's the perfect storm for these things to move very, very quickly. Absolutely. That that leads me perfectly into my next one, which is looking at the space now. And I'll get into a forward looking forecast later. But what is the most overhyped aspect of Web three gaming at the moment? The most overhyped aspect of Web three gaming right now. Um, 
I think for me, it's that like everyone fixates on play to earn as being like this revolutionary format in the games industry. And although it's like it is really cool and it is an impactful format, I I think people sometimes make the have this misconception that play to earn is blockchain gaming. Whereas I think blockchain gaming will serve as a pretty big a subsection of the games industry, but play to earn will be a part of that not the whole thing. And so I think people conflate that when they're like, oh, blockchain gaming is play to earn. I'm like, no, no, no. It like very much is not. It is a part of it. Uh, so that that's probably the overhyped part because I think it then, because of that, people miss the boat, right? All of a sudden they're like, oh, if blockchain gaming is, I've got to, you know, I'm only playing because I'm earning money behind it. Then like I play games for fun and that takes it out of fun. It's like, stop, you know? I spend, you know, hundreds of bucks in Valorant and I'm having a ton of fun and I don't play it because of the earning mechanics, but I can tell you what, I bought really cool skins in season one that they haven't brought back out again. And it was like, I think that there's real value in selling that. And I wish I could actually have more participation and voting for nerfs and buffs of champions and agents, right? Like, you know, so anyway, I think people really underestimate other awesome mechanics that blockchain games are going to provide outside of this play to earn model, which largely will be tailored towards, um, lower monetizing markets and regions. Like, I don't think you'll ever get the tokenomics balance in a way that will meaningfully scale in more Western established regions where the earning mechanism is a uh, point of focus for the player, if that makes sense. Yeah, that totally makes a lot of sense. We're humans. We like mental models. We want easy. Play to earn is blockchain gaming, full stop. You know, it's 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 pretty easy yeah. to think about things like that. And that's people's mental models to understand the space, but it's a lot more vibrant. And there's a lot more going on uh, in the space <laughs> overall. Wild disservice to what's happening in the space and kind of the projects people are working on. Yeah. Right. And I think I think play to earn, I mean, it is a bit of a misnomer. Like I play to play, I earn to earn, play to earn. It's kind of odd to me, but I, I think aspects of that will carry over. And, and these are all like, you know, practice for the final form and little little pieces of it will be carried along to the, the next iteration. On, on, on next iteration, I mean, how do you see blockchain games evolving in the next five to 10 years or adjust the timeline accordingly if you have a better one yeah five to ten years i just would be like too full of shit to give you an answer because who knows right uh, <laughs> if knows. i knew what five to ten years is going to be i'd already been retired by now man yeah i think um i think the big thing that's going to happen too is you're going to start to see some of these games that people have spent you know years building like you know large-scale mmos and mmorpgs and you know, high fidelity tactical shooters. And you're going to start to see games like this where the marketplace is, you know, is is kind of an open marketplace where people are trading and purchasing assets and, you know, it, you know, participating in the token structure and DAOs are being formed around it. Like you're going to start to see these games at scale and people really just really just plug into them as they as they otherwise would. Right. You know, like there, I think some of these things are so community oriented. And so what I really expect is the time you will see one, the friction will be significantly reduced people coming into games. So I think that'll be great, right? Like you'll see that right now, like do, nobody's setting up a MetaMask wallet. Like, so this crypto like industry, like get over it. Like you're not going to get a billion people on the MetaMask experience right now. So like wallets will inherently get better. Integrations of wallets into games will get better. And so that will be a much more like the on ramps and all of that will be much more fluid. And that's a big hurdle and that, but that'll be resolved in the, let's say like, the next five years. Like, I don't, I think it's a non-issue. Games will be really good with bridging, right? Like if anybody knows how to take somebody game to understand it, it's, it's or like an experience, it's video games, right? Like they are so good at creating tutorials for people to understand complex things within a game so they can pick up and enjoy it. So I think games will do a beautiful job at simplifying bridging in combination with these like you know, wallets that a lot of things are happening in the background and people are just playing and participating. And then, yeah, you're going to see these really great games. I mean, there are some will already start coming out. The other thing I think you'll see are off-chain, on-chain hybrid experiences to open the funnel in the next five years. Like you'll be able to come into a really cool game. And if you're like so allergic to this open marketplace aspect of it, then you don't need to participate in it. But there will have an element of it that allows players to you know, integrate and connect their wallet and participate on the, the the on-chain part of it, which I think will be really cool too. And I think really good in increasing the funnel of users into the space. So yeah, that, that's what I'm most excited for. Like higher fidelity games, more seamless uh, wallet integrations and reduced friction points for onboarding gamers. And then that the crypto element will be pretty passive in the background. 
you're like, oh, X game just came out. I can't wait to go play with my friends. And you're like, boom, I'm setting up my account. I don't have a Coinbase account. I'm using a Coinbase wallet. Now I am. Boom, I'm in, right? You know, you're not talking about the game is built on Polygon. You just know that the transactions are really low from a cost perspective and, and that, you know, we're reliable, right? Like that's kind of where we got to be in five years. I mean, that it's not really like, what I think it will be, we have to be there in five years as an industry, because I think people are relatively impatient and we will need to demonstrate success as a, as a, as a movement and in industry by then. And so that's where I know that's where we've got to get to in five years. I love it. And all the you know crypto decentralization purists hate it, but this off chain, on chain, blended passive blockchain kind of designed game will truly onboard more people. They won't know that they're on a blockchain. It will have these blockchain characteristics, but it will be obfuscated in the background and uh, reduce the friction. That's a big and one I for sure. And I think the thing too about that, like I totally empathize with the, the people that are decentralized, decentralization purists and like, that's cool. And like you, you should, and there will be great experiences for, for you as well, right? You just have to understand that like when we get to a billion people on crypto, we're going to need to have, that will be a spectrum. And and the start of the spectrum is information is on chain, right? Like at some point you can't be web 2.5. So like it's on chain, right? Information and, and data and all of that is there. And then you will have varying degrees all the way to the purest level of decentralization to that. And so I think once people realize there will be a spectrum and there'll be people that have differing opinions on some of this. Um, and so that'll be, you know, just like people have differing opinions on on what level of privacy that they're comfortable with in web 2. Some people like want to share everything. Some people don't want to share anything and want to be an Adon. And that's okay that both of those people exist and everything in between, right? And then the experiences are tailored accordingly. Facebook, you have to have a you know real name to set up, right? Twitter, you could be like an NFT avatar and people could like have no idea who the hell you are forever. And that's cool as well too, right? So I, I think we'll just have to get used to being okay with billions of people using something and there being something for everybody. Absolutely. And- you, you touched on this a bit with metaverse and some of these other things, but I, I, I have this theory about the overall convergence of metaverse and DAOs, social tokens, DeFi, NFTs, blockchain gaming into this this big thing that's no longer uh, clear lines. They've all kind of blurred. Do you have any sort of overarching thesis on some of these other themes within the blockchain crypto space and how they play into uh, blockchain gaming? You mean like like DAOs, metaverse, or or meta, DAOs. Or metaverse. yeah? Well, yeah. I mean, guilds make a ton. I mean, guilds are pretty straightforward just because of the economies and in marketplace. I mean, like guilds make a ton of sense. It's like kind of a weird, lazy way of explaining it, like the evolution of esports in a world where you have kind of like community ownership and free marketplaces. And I think DAOs also are like an evolution of forums and communities, right? Like because of those same reasons, now they have ways to organize in unique ways. So I don't know that I have like a unique thesis on where those net out other than I think they're both going to be just like integral parts of the evolution of Web3 blockchain games, right? Like they just are very necessary and and because they can be created in these environments, they, they should be. And I think, you know, the best ones and will rise to the top and will be the main facilitator there. I think with the metaverse, you know, my, you know, the way I, I, I think everybody, first of all, is a different interpretation of the metaverse. For me, I kind of break it down very simply. And the idea that we are spending more time on, in, on devices, those devices are all digital experiences. And those digital experiences are getting much, like, much richer and much more complex. And that's kind of like how we, you know, I was talking about at the beginning. And so because of that, you know, people, one, it's going to be hyper fragmented. Like, I don't think, I do think a Facebook can participate or a Google or any of these big tech companies will have a place in the world. They're not going to wall guard and own it like Google owns search, you know, or like Facebook has WhatsApp and Instagram and so forth, right? Like there won't be that same dominant level of ownership. I don't think the industry will allow for that. And I, I, and I think there will be too much optionality of different experiences in the, in, in this so-called, you, you just can't, you won't be able to get to that level of, of ownership uh, that you could in Web2, which I think is really, really good. So I think it's very fragmented and I think it has all kind of different experiences cultivated for different people much like society exists today where we're, you know, diff- different strokes for different folks. And I think that's kind of how these digital worlds will keep being, you know, created and how people will spend time in them. Um, yeah. So that's my, that's my thought. And then some of them, I think there was opportunity for partnerships and interconnectivity between them and, and interoperability between them. Oh yeah. 
All right, last question. My audience with this podcast is mostly investors, obviously yeah. not, not financial advice, but how should investors think about getting more involved with Web3 or blockchain gaming? Yeah, I think, look, it kind of touches back on my initial point of there's a lot of projects and a lot of capital being deployed in the space, right? And gaming before this even was the case was really hard. Look at game like Halo, you know, with, with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars at their disposal to create a game. And it's a good game. And it already is getting kind of lackluster user base. And they're having to think about how to keep it fresh. And do they launch a battle royale and all of these things, right? So just take this from a company that has launched successful games that was as well funded as you possibly can be with an IP that like literally I started playing Halo, I think when I was 12 years old, right? So, and I'm 35. So, you know what I'm saying? It had everything going for it and it still struggles. So just remember, that's your benchmark, right? That, 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 that game, like, and if you want to even get as close as the success of that game, think about what has happened to get there, the years it took to develop. So have, again, appreciation for what, you know, what takes to make a game that gets a critical user base. Second, I think it would be to make sure that you have people that understand both tokenomics and game development working together. I always like in, when I'm looking at kind of decks, I like forefront of people that are talking like we have this game dev team and we have these people that know exactly how to monetize the ecosystem and work with it. And like those are so critical. Anything else? Can you be successful? Absolutely, right? But you really, really are reducing the certainty. In an already world where there is no certainty, you're reducing the probability of it being successful, and you're starting to deem luck because of the complexity of game development and um, tokenomics and you know balancing economy. So anyway, I, I think to investors, it would be I would be highly critical of those two things instead of like, oh, you know, I like the founders and the game looks cool, right? I I, I think people are not scrutinizing that. And my last note on this, and then we can we can stop. My last note on this would be understand that there has been billions of dollars deployed in game development in the last 24 months, right? Both from venture, big game publishers, also M&As and likes we've never seen. The outcome of this, which we haven't seen yet, is going to be so many games. The optionality for gamers is going to be absurdly high, which is great for gamers, right? We're going to get everything we ever wanted in every way, shape, and form. But you're going to see a massive fragmentation of game audiences. Like instead of this consolidation into a handful of titles like you've seen, this is going to start to get disrupted. It's going to have an impact on the Twitch streaming, the YouTube gaming of the world. It's going to have an impact on the creator economy in a good way, right? Because of the fragmentation. And so I think people should understand that like developers better have an awesome, robust Go to market and community element, or else doesn't matter if you just make a great game. That will not be enough anymore to just make a great game. And so I think a lot of developers are, I'm going to put my head down, I'm going to make a really cool game, and I'm going to come up for air and then think about how we actually tap into a go to market strategy and activate. And I think they're going to be in for a rude awakening if they don't think about that much earlier in the development cycle. That's it. So those would be the questions if I'm, I do invest. So these are the questions I ask, but this is how I would look at it. Yes. Man, just gold. Ryan, again, I could just talk to you for hours on this. Ryan, really appreciate it. It's been great. There you go. First off, thank you very much for listening all the way through. I hope you got a lot of value out of that conversation. As always, you can find show notes, links, and more at altassetallocation.com. Please share this with anyone you think might be interested and derive any value from this conversation. And as always, you can reach out to me for any feedback or questions. Please give the video a like or even better subscribe on YouTube or your podcast player of choice. This really helps others find the podcast or the video as well. Thanks a lot. Hope everybody has a fantastic day and stay safe out there and invest wisely. Cheers. Easily. Cheers. Easily. Cheers, Isley. Cheers, Isley. Cheers, Isley.